Good day, John. First of all, thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this Skype interview as part of my HPT Human Performance Technology video series. As we discussed uh, in the preparation for actually recording this interview, uh, you and I met back in 1981 at the ISPI chapter of Chicago. Back then it was the NSPI chapter of Chicago. But uh, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, first of all, where you live and work and what you do and maybe some of the more interesting things that you've worked on in your career. Certainly. Uh, and Guy, thanks so much for the invite. Uh, love love to have the conversation, as you might well imagine. I certainly enjoy talking about myself. Uh, so, John Lazar, I live and work in Forest Park, Illinois, which is a suburb near west of Chicago. And um, I am a performance consultant and leadership and executive coach. Been doing that for uh, 36 years, something like that. And this is my second career. So my formal training, I uh, was in psychology and clinical psychology, uh, both from schools here in the Chicago area. And uh, in, that, in that field, I worked as an analyst working with severely and profoundly handicapped children and their families. And I also had a private psychotherapy practice. And after I completed my master's degree, I had to figure out if I wanted to go on for a doctorate or, or do something else. And I, in, in the end of the day, I decided that I was going to do something else. Um, and there's a story that will go along with like what that something else was. But in the, in the end, what it was was uh, solving human performance problems in organizations. And so... When I, when I did that career change, which was in 1983, uh, the first job that I took was as a technical training consultant with a firm out in Oak Brook Terrace, um, owned and run by a guy by the name of Bob DeFilippis. And my job there was instructional design, training, um, a little bit of curriculum design over the couple of years that I worked with him. Um, in 86, I received three different job offers from AT&T uh, to work for them and went to work for them in, uh, in Lyle, Illinois, uh, as a performance consultant. And so I was, I was an internal um, consultant doing everything from front end to back end and everything in between for the part of the company that in designed, installed, troubleshot, maintained the 5ESS, the long distance switch. And I worked there from 86 to the end of 93, uh, took a leave of absence with no intention of going back and started work uh, a week later for Judy Hale uh, as a consultant for her and her business, Hale Associates in Westchester and did that for um, about 14 or 15 months, and then started my own, my own company, John B. Lazar & Associates. So I've had my own company now for uh, 24 years. And uh, from the start, it's been about um, leadership, leadership and executive coaching, team development, and what I'll call blended interventions, and I'll explain that a little bit later. In terms of some of the more interesting things I've worked on in my career, uh, beyond just like job descriptions, I, one of, I think one of the most exciting things that I did uh, was to work on a project, two projects for AT&T. One, I was paired up with several instructional designers and subject matter experts, and the intention initially was to develop training for Tier 2 and Tier 3 tech support for the long distance switch. But when we looked a bit closer and we actually applied um, human performance technology, what we discovered was that a, a training solution was really inappropriate and that what these folks needed was a job aid, um, or rather 
extensive job aid, as you might well imagine, but a job aid nonetheless. And so my colleague, uh, Pat McCann, and I spent more than a year working with numerous subject matter experts uh, throughout AT&T uh, to gather data and make sense and, and map out exactly what this job aid was going to be. And in the end, uh, we had a job aid. This, this was uh, in paper form rather than in, a, in, in computerized form. It would have been beautiful that way, but in paper form. Um, that allowed the company to reduce its downtime by more than 10% and uh, to increase its revenues and customer satisfaction significantly. So that was a really, really neat project. And it's, it's probably the, the one thing that I've done. It's one of the things that I've done that I have the greatest pride in was in developing that because we, in, we came up with um, the mapping that even even the subject matter experts didn't know was there. We identified disconnects and dead ends and God knows what else. So it was just like very, very neat to great source of professional satisfaction uh, to come up with that. Uh, towards the end of my time at at and I also worked on a project, a special project for the gentleman who was a chief technology officer for at and and it was a presentation um, about software and software development and what the needs were that was going to be delivered by um, by him to Bob Allen, who at that time was CEO and the executive committee of at and Now, you need to know that software and software expertise is not, uh, that's not my, my deep area. It's just like, it was like, who me? Um, but I worked on I worked on the project I worked on the project uh, for close to nine months and put together a reasonably solid package, delivered it to the gentleman who was less than completely satisfied and ended up firing me for it. Um, but it was an extraordinary learning experience. You know, sometimes the, the the most powerful learning experiences are not necessarily the ones where we where we where we take a victory lap. Um, but it gave me a much, much deeper appreciation for what's what's involved in in doing good development, in doing a much better job up front in terms of the front end and understanding whether or not, in fact, I was the right person uh, rather than simply the designated person to be on the project in the first place. And and I ended up certainly with lots of little factoids about uh, uh, about software and software development that I that I could entertain my friends with at cocktail parties. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, let's go back a little bit then. So tell me, talk to us a little bit about uh, your first exposure to human performance technology, HPT, or however you refer to it. Where, how, how did you come across this exactly? And, uh, you know, who was involved? And uh, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, it was rather serendipitous. Um, back in 1979, uh, while I was still deeply involved in my psychology work, and uh, one of one of the areas that I, I had been studying, two of the areas that I'd been studying were, was neuro linguistic programming and Ericksonian hypnosis. Um, I was doing a a presentation, a workshop in Evanston, Illinois, which is a suburb north of Chicago, on neuro linguistic programming. Judy Hale was one of the attendees. So she attended my session, like a half-day session, and she came in hobbling on crutches. For, for those of you who know Judy, uh, you may know that that's been a condition of hers periodically over the years. That was my first time meeting her. Um, but after the, after the, uh, after the workshop, we, we, we took the time to chat, and I just found her... Positive, just extraordinarily fascinating, like a really, really neat, neat person, a nice person, extraordinarily bright person, um, somebody who had points of view that she was willing to share and was willing to back up with, you know, she could ground her assessments and, and, and tell a really, really good story. So in, in listening to her and getting to know her, I asked 
about her and, and her background. And so she told me about HPT. Um, and it intrigued me because what, from what she told me about it, the piece about being um, results-oriented and data-driven and systemic and systematic, that kind of stuff, that was very much, the, the, those, those statements resonated very, very strongly for me. And it had enough of an impression on me that even though I was still working in the field in, in psychology and, and doing work with severely profoundly handicapped kids and so on and so forth, I, I wanted to know more about this. And so I started doing a little bit of reading about it and, and kind of peeking around the edges and being curious. Um, a couple of years later in 1981, I joined NSPI. I was still working in psychology, but um, it seemed like the right thing to do. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't working in the field. And so it made sense to me to like, well, what can I do to get my kind of dip a toe in the water? And so there was a workshop that was being offered at National Lewis University in Evanston by a gentleman by the name of Ken Silber. Uh, and uh, and I think I think it was on it was it was bigger than instructional design, so it, it had to do with taking an HPT approach to things. So I signed up for that. And while I was there, one of the people that I met was a woman by the name of Lynn Carney from Oakland. And uh, we kind of hit it off, and and the three of us kind of hit it off. And so. That was, like, again, a very, very enjoyable experience, um, an enriching experience because I was learning about things and learning about things from a perspective that, that, I, that I hadn't, hadn't known anything about. So it was like brave new world stuff. And I had these neat new people in my life uh, that were both affiliated with this organization that I was a new member of. Um, so I continued to poke around and continued to to read and try to do a little bit more and find out a little bit more. In 1983, I actually changed careers. So I had gotten my degree, and in, in, in earlier in the year, I took six months to figure things out, and what I ended up with was what I told you, mm -hmm. uh, solving human performance problems in organizations. And it because it, it just seemed to be a place where, where one had an opportunity to, um, to have a larger impact, number one. But number two, the context in which it was occurring, work, which is where I was looking to apply it, seemed to me to be a great place to play. And the reason I say that is because we spend so much of our time there at work. We, we have so much of ourselves caught up in work from the perspective of our, our professional identity, from, from our financial situation, a whole bunch of different areas that um, it just made great sense for me to want to be working in this organizational setting and seeing if I could have the kind of impact where I, where I could contribute to what workplaces that work, I think, was the way that I thought about it to myself mm -hmm. at, that, at that point in time. Um, so change careers in 83. In 83 or 84... Uh, I think I attended my first um, NSPI conference, which I believe was in Atlanta. And so that was that was really, really neat. And uh, I'll tell you a story a little bit later about about that. Uh, but I met a lot of, a lot of folks that I'd only heard about or seen their their names on uh, on the front covers of books that were revered by people in the industry. So that was kind of fun, and um, I got involved in the local chapter. Um, I I volunteered and played a role as uh, somebody who ran uh, volunteers, uh, student volunteers, for conferences three years running, which was which was great fun. Um, for one conference, 
Um, I was Carol Haig's right-hand person for making the conference happen while in San Francisco, and she and she's extraordinary. She does. She she did she did great work. Continues to do great work, even post retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had I had that. And then I even I even was able while I was at AT and T in the mid late eighties was able to um, enroll them in financially supporting me in taking a three year program called the ontological design course on uh, study of what it is to be a human being because I could make the I made the argument successfully to them that it was going to contribute to my being a better consultant and being able to return a larger investment um, on the work that we did uh, within network systems and for, for AT&T. So um, that's, a, that's a little bit of the, uh, of the beginnings, but, it, but it, was, it was very, very exciting to me. And uh, I was probably, probably more wide-eyed puppy-like than I would, pref would have preferred to be, but that's what it was. Mm -hmm. Well, you 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 mentioned some really great people, um, Judy Hale and Ken Silver and Lynn Carney and Carol Haig, and you know that's quite a, a great entree to um, the society, the people of the society, and this uh, technology, the application of science uh, for performance improvement. Uh, let's go back a little bit. So so you've mentioned some of the people that were perhaps some of your initial influences in that. Um, do you recall any articles or books in particular that uh, you might mention so that others now that are entering into this now might want to go back and research? Yeah, so you I'm, I'm not going to do a great job of this, but, but you know, certainly Tom, Tom Gilbert's book on human confidence, um, Bob, Bob Mager's series, you know, his six pack. Um, the book that, that that he wrote with Peter Pipe on job aids, um, Joe Harless, um, and I went and I went through Joe Harless's uh, accomplishment-based curriculum development process. I mean, if there were, ever there was a man um, who brought rigor to a new level, um, it would be Joe. Gary Rumler, of course, um, Roger Kaufman, and and his work on. Uh, on, on strategic planning and on mega mega planning, um, Odin Westgard uh, and Odin Odin for a number of years was married to Judy Hale, and the work that they did together, and the work that he did on uh, tests and testing, um, and writing good fair tests, and um, let's see, those are those are and, and Judy's work. Um, I've stayed. I've remained friends with Judy for now um, forty years. Mm -hmm. wow. So, uh, and and I I have as much or more respect for her. Just like she just just you know she's like the Everetti Bunny. <laughs> uh, she just keeps on going, and she does she does wonderful work that is. Uh, as as a colleague, I would say with backbone and heart. So it's it's about the rigor and and the the intentionality to produce results and also taking care of the people. So she she has forever been a great modeler of that for me. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Uh, let me shift gears here a little bit. So. Um, if you were to give a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, how you apply human performance technology or, or however you phrase that, however you position that, uh, what is your example of that so that others might, you know, learn from, borrow from, steal from, um, uh, elevator speech? Okay. So I, I work with leaders and their teams to elevate their performance, their results, and their engagement. Um, I, I enable them to shift their mindsets, expand their skill sets, and develop emotionally intelligent leadership and management practices. And as a result of that, what gets produced is uh, improved execution, um, stronger working relationships, and better business results. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
No. How, so where? So uh, how do you go about looking for clients? It's always uh, uh, something of interest for those uh, who are out on their own or who dream of going out on their own. Um, how do you market yourself and your services uh, as uh, an HPT or? Uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> I have uh, the, the the marketing sales game has never been my strong suit. Um, it's it's a bit better now, but it was never it was never my strong suit. And so a lot of what I did was came came by word of mouth came by who I knew, net, the networking that I did, and uh, getting better at the networking. I've, I've had my own website for a number of years and um, am doing better at asking for referrals from clients who are, who are delighted with the work that I do, mm -hmm. and, uh, see, see the value in sharing, in sharing that kind of access with, with people who find themselves in, with similar kinds of challenges. Um, and I have a colleague um, who's working with a marketing and sales firm in the UK right now and is testing them out in terms of getting bona fide hot leads mm -hmm. for him. And he's in, I think, month two or month three of that process. And I am one of several people who is kind of waiting to see how is it going and whether that's something that I'm going to do. I think the one of the conclusions that I've come to, Guy, is that um, marketing and sales is a necessary, um, a necessary part of, of having a business. Mm -hmm. When we're inside an organization, we may be oblivious to that because other people are doing it for us, just like the organization is taking care of so much of what's around us and what, what enables us to do good work. But when you have your own company, you not only have to be a good practitioner, a solid practitioner, but you have to be a solid business person as well. And I've kind of learned that the hard way through non-example rather than through example. Um, and I, I will say, though, that I've stuck around long enough and the last I think the last each of the last five years has been a best year yet for me. In, ter in terms of clientele and in terms of revenue generation, so I'm apparently doing some of the some some of the right things right, and um, it it doesn't go it doesn't it doesn't go away, and and so I twenty twenty four years into my business, I'm still kind of a beginner. At, at, at marketing and sales, but I will say that uh, whatever, find out like what, what you're good, you know, what, what are you good at? Um, because that's where, that's where the leverage is. Find out the other areas that, that need to be taken care of, such as marketing and sales, and find ways of taking care of that well whether it's partnering with somebody, whether it's running it, whatever the heck it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the coaching work that I do, I've often found in working with solopreneurs and small business folks that they're, they're passionate about what they do professionally and they haven't put much attention on being a good business person. And in truth, if, you don't, if, you, if you're not a good business person, you never... You never have the opportunity to deliver and shine on that on those areas for which you're passion. You're, you 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 have passion, so um, they complement each other. They have to take care of it, and whether or not it may aggravate us that uh, damn it, I really don't want to do that. Um, you know, it's like take your take your medicine and get it done and do it do it well. Mm -hmm. You can do it, and if you can do it with grace and ease, that that's even better. Yeah, that's one aspect of being in the business when you're out on your own that you've got to do that kind of continuous marketing and sales efforts. You've got to pay attention to the bottom line. You, there's many things, you know, in your networking. It's a continuous effort to continuous network for your own, uh, for marketing yourself and or just from learning from others. And that, that allows me to segue into my next question here, which is, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your current or next focus for your own learning? Are you 
writing? Are you, you know, uh, so what focus or foci do you have in terms of what you're exploring as a lifelong learner? Okay. Um, several things. So I, I can't, I made a decision late, late last year that I'm going to write a book on, on self-leadership. Um, best as I can tell, leadership starts at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I actually just did a webinar last week, or earlier this week, on um, leadership authoring for self and with others. And the contention that I have based on my reading of the literature is that uh, we have to we have to organize organize ourselves well if we're going to be able to do good work with and for others. And so to that to that extent, I want to I want to I, I make I'm not making any claim right now that I've got something um, new, necessarily new that I want to say, though, probably the way I'm going to put it together and the, the way I'm going to talk about it, it's, it's certainly going to have my flavor to it. But I, it's important for me whether the only copy sold is the one that I sold to myself, which which would speak to my good sales technique, by the way. <laughs> um, that it's important, it's important for me to enable that expression and to see where that leads. So that's, that's one thing that's going on. Um, I have a colleague and friend out in Denver by the name of Joe Slater who has a company called Better Practice. And Better Practice is a relatively new company. It's been around for, I think, five or six years. And it's about, it's about uh, figuring out what matters most, making better decisions faster, and executing with grace and accountability. And I met Joe at a, at a Berkman uh, assessment conference in Houston several years ago. And when I met him, I, I immediately knew that I wanted to get him to know him better and I wanted to do something with him. So we've been working towards that for the past four plus years. And um, it's taken a couple of different forms. Uh, Joe and I in 2018 spoke at the ISPI conference uh, in Seattle and at the EMEA conference in Gothenburg, Sweden. And we're scheduled to speak uh, this year in New Orleans at the ISPI conference. So that's one, one thing. Um, Joe's got a project with a, with a, with a client um, that's designed to help business, business owners make an effective transition when they're ready to either give their business to the next generation of, of, of leaders and owners or to sell the business. So this notion of um, transition readiness is, um, is really, really important as I've come to learn. So, so we're working with a gentleman by the name of Sean Hutchinson and his company, Strategic Value Advisors. And we're just about ready to launch a couple of programs around that. And what I didn't realize is that, um, especially in family-owned businesses, um, there's, a, there's a great deal of risk associated with being a family-owned business owner, in large part because I think uh, 75 to 95% of, your, of your, um, your assets are tied up in the business. And so you don't have a diversified portfolio. And um, if you're going to get the most out of that, when, if and when you're ready to transition to what's the next chapter of your life rather than to die at your desk, mm-hmm. then, then it actually takes something to make that happen and happen well. And what did he say? By the fourth generation, only... only 12% of fourth-generation businesses transition or, or, even, or even around. I mean, so it's, it's, there's a high mortality rate as soon as you, as you move from generation to generation. And it's only, it's only slightly less um, risky if, you, if you're not just a, family, a, a family-owned business owner but just a business owner. The, the issues around transition are still large. 
are, are rather um, compendious. There's a lot of different aspects that need to be taken into account. And there's a lot of emotional stuff that needs to be dealt with so that you can ultimately do the good work that you need to do in order to transition well, not only for yourself, but for those who are going to be left behind. Um, as it turns out, there's work to be done. There's leadership and leadership development work to be done in this. And so on this project, I'm going to be working with Joe um, in, a, in a kind of integrated way to, uh, to, to make this happen in a way that they, they, get, they get things at a more technical level, but then they also get the, uh, the leading self and leading others practices that they also need in order to, to accelerate and have things go more smoothly. So there's, there's that going on. I think the final piece is that um, in a relatively short period of time last year, last fall, I attended three different events, one Perky, one in Denver, and one in Barcelona, um, on economic development. And so there was, a, there was a, a think tank event in Albuquerque that I attended and a disrupted, disrupt economic development uh, conference in Denver. And then Mariano Bernardez had his city doctors uh, forum in Barcelona work, working with Barcelona Activa, which for the past 30 years has been doing extraordinary work in the neighborhoods of Barcelona. And... Um, that in conjunction with some work that I've been doing on the board with um, an organization called the Association for, um, it, does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But the point is that there's work to be done around economic development mm -hmm. um, at a municipal level, at a regional level, and uh, in support of individuals and groups within within. Within cities, so Mariano's work with Barrio 31 in, in Buenos Aires, or the work that he did in Cologne City, Panama, or the work that we did in the Sonora region of Mexico, all of those are examples of taking HPT um, and a, a variety of approaches, and uh, very much that systemic, systematic, uh, results-oriented, triple bottom line kind of way of thinking about things, and and. Uh, Having the persistence and the patience to work over a number, over a number of years with a variety of stakeholders to to produce new structures, new commitments, um, new infrastructure, new businesses, new results that that um, can be sustained over time. It's not just about a momentary blip. It's about what can you sustain. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure exactly how this piece is going to play out, the, the economic development piece. Again, this is not an area where I have expertise, but it, it, it very much is an area where, where for those who are willing to play, and uh, they can make a difference, and, and it's a difference that can make a difference. And so it may be that out of the work that we did in Barcelona last fall, there will be work to be done in Barcelona with... Uh, with the government and with Barcelona Activa in 2019 and beyond remains to be seen. But um, I enjoy I enjoy Mariano, and he's very, for me, he's very much of a renaissance kind of a guy. And so um, if I can give myself an excuse for uh, for playing in the sandbox with him, I'm, I'm up for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, let me see switch gears a little bit here to my sixth question, which is regarding HPT terminology. So is, is there a, a favorite or uh, questionable HPT kind of term or phrase that you would like to define for us because you feel perhaps maybe it's being misused or you would like to clarify uh, your perspective on that? Do you have something? Uh, I I do, uh, but I'm not going to make a claim that 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 you know that HPT has been unclear about something. I'm, I'm just going to say that if I look at if I if I look at some of the HPT models, it looks like by the time you run yourself through the process, um, 
you arrive you arrive at at, at a, a solution like an intervention, mm-hmm. an, an intervention to then implement and then evaluate. And um, one of the many things, one of the many things that I learned from Judy uh, was she quoted a piece of doctoral research. Uh, I think she was on the the doctoral committee for um, the woman at Indiana University, Erica Gilmore. And Erica was looking at what's what's the relationship between um, performance problems and solutions. And on average, what she found was on average for any for any performance problem you had, you would have at least three root causes and at least four solutions. Mm-hmm. Now, for whatever reason, that that factoid stuck with me. And I think part of the reason that it stuck with me is that in a lot of the things that I've seen and experienced and hear at conferences and talking with fellow practitioners, there seems to be a tendency towards assuming a sufficiency of arriving at a single solution as the answer. And as best as I can tell, and in, in my view, it's supported by Erica's research, uh, that you're almost certain to be leaving impact, value, and money on the table if that if that happens to be your point of view. So, kind of kind of in noodling about that and thinking about that and talking about that with colleagues, I decided that one of the things one of the things that I wanted to do was I wanted to put together a presentation on, on, on this issue. And so I asked a couple of colleagues of mine, Daniela Robu, who I met at, at, uh, at the ISPI conference, at one of the ISPI conferences. Um, and she is director of knowledge management at Alberta, Alberta Health Services up in uh, Calgary, Alberta. And Edie Greenblatt, and Edie is a Harvard, Harvard PhD, OD person, McKinsey, former McKinsey consultant, executive coach, who now splits her time between Israel and the United States. Um, I asked the two of them if they wanted to play with me on this. And what we ended up doing was we, we put together a proposal to present at the ISPI EMEA conference in Bologna in 2017, which was accepted. And and the the thrust of our presentation was on what what we call blended blended solutions. So my term that that I wanted to share with you and with our listeners was a blend blended solution, which and I get to I get to refer to my notes here, mm-hmm. uh, which is a set of interventions holistically and synergistic and implemented. So, typically, right what the left hand is doing, if there's multiple interventions going on, there's no else is going on within the system, linked to in that it will likely include one or more simultaneous, integrated, interdependent, synergistic interventions. It'll address the same root causes redundantly. It's, it's taking a rigorous approach to understanding what's at the heart of that. It's 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 for the sake of value. It's it's engendering conversations about what are the things that are worth trying to do something about, and then it it 
it allows one to take a step back to say, okay, so if we're going to do this and we have buy-in from the decision makers and the stakeholders, what what makes the most sense in terms of an effective an effective design that accounts for the pieces that we say that we're looking to implement? So I like that. I, I, I consider myself in, you know, Guy, most of the work that I do, I would say probably 85, 90% of the work that I do I would, is, is leadership and executive coaching. I consider, I consider myself, um, a performance consultant whose passion is coaching. But in saying that, I, I always, bless you, I always, I always wear that HPT hat. And one of the implications of that for me is that it means that I need to be intervention agnostic. The, the data and the analysis of the data is going to suggest what, what intervention or set of interventions is going to be most appropriate. So I, I try to I try to bring that mindset into into the work that I do, and as as you know, as Joe Harless would say, your your clients will always lie to you, and and part of your job is to listen well, listen deeply, and in the end to propose and give them what they need, disguised as what they want. <laughs> Well, that's that's excellent. I'm I'm going to ask you to send me what you just said about blended solutions because I would like to include that in the in the blog post that I'll do that uh, goes along with the release of this video. I will if you want. I can send you the deck or or a PDF of the deck. Oh, sure, excellent. Thank you. Sure, I can share that then with uh, with our audience. Um, let me segue into the the final section of this interview here. Um, as we discussed earlier, I, I was looking for stories of, of other people that practice HPT, whether they call it that or not, whether they are members of ISPI or NSPI or not. Um, and we've talked about this and you're, you're going to, and I want to humanize some of those people uh, that, that others that are maybe new to the field or recent to the field um, have maybe heard about, but but they don't know. Yep. So that what we get is a cold, sterile picture, understanding uh, view of somebody. And uh, so I'd like to see if we could bring uh, some of them to life. Now, sure. You told me that you had a story to share with us about Odin Westgard, uh, somebody who that uh, you you obviously uh, really uh, uh, like and appreciate, and and me too. I'm I'm, an, I'm a fan of Odin. I haven't seen him for a long time. Is but anyway, so. Yeah. Please uh, tell us a little bit about Odin Westgard. Sure. So, so as I said, um, Odin Westgard for, was married to, to Judy Hale for a number of years, um, and it was in that context that I that I met Odin because I was friends with Judy, and when I would come over to her house in Oak Park, um, I met Odin, mm -hmm. and. Um, my story, my story about Odin. There's probably two stories about Odin. One, one, one is one is that we uh, uh, we we took a golfing trip together, which which was uh, which was an a, an interesting, fun, challenging trip. Um, just just kind of kind of finding the right space, <laughs> the, the right space, and the right dance to do with each other. Uh, we enjoyed we we enjoyed each other's company tremendously. We had different we had different styles and different points of view. We enjoyed golf. Could 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 look on it philosophically, so not take ourselves too seriously, which helped tremendously given our games. Um, and and it was it was a lot of it was a lot of fun and being on the road together for several days each in each direction also gave us a grand opportunity to just to talk and to philosophize which was which was great fun um, the other Odin story is that when when I made decisions in the mid 80s to start 
that, that it was going to be important for me to develop my own voice and have things to say, even, even as a beginner in the field of HPT. Um, I, had a, I had a great deal of respect for Judy and Odin, um, not only for how they thought, but how they, how they wrote. And both of them had books out and were working on other books and things like that. So I asked Odin if he would be willing to um, review and edit things that I wrote. Now, you may not know this guy, but, you know, unlike other, other people who do editing with a, red, with a red pen, Odin used a green one. So I'm, I am, you know, I, I, ha, I, I forever have a smile on my face, on my face wherever I see a, a green, you know, Sharpie uh, felt him pen. And um, whatever it is that I was drafting, it, it would come back bloody and green with, with Odin's suggested edits, which at one and the same time pissed the hell out of me, mm. were spot on. Now, um, I'd like to believe, I'd like to believe that I've gotten better over the years. Um, actually, I know that I, that I have, and there's always room for improvement, but, but Odin, Odin did me a tremendous service by his willingness to take the time and make the effort and be, be uh, direct with me about where the workability was and stuff. As I, as I, as I think about it, Guy, um, one of the ways that that showed up subsequently is that in the early 2000s, um, I, I, I started a second business um, in 2002. I started a second business with a colleague of mine, Bill Berquist, which was a publishing company. And for more than nine years, we published a coaching journal called the International Journal of Coaching and Organizations and put out over that time 32 issues and more than 175 articles and got better each year. And one of the things that I'm, that I'm thinking about is that one of the biggest, perhaps the, the biggest pleasure, even more than getting an issue out the door, was in being able to sit down with an author and take, take an idea of theirs and work with them to turn it into something that was really excellent. It was... Um, it was a great source of satisfaction for me and from what the folks that I work with uh, have shared with me. It was, it was incredibly valuable for them as well. Um, my, my Judy Odin story is that I think in 1984, the NSPI conference was in Atlanta and the three of us drove down and back to Atlanta. So that was, if I say that was a trip, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, really great fun. And uh, to your point about humanizing people, I, I, that, that conference in Atlanta, um, Judy and Odin took special care of me, and one of the ways that they took special care of me was they went out of their way to introduce me to people at the conference. So I met Tom Gilbert, and I met Bob Mager, and I met Roger Kaufman, I met Joe Harless, and I met Gary Rumler, and I met da 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 And what I was really struck by, it, it, and to me it has continued to this day, what I was really struck by was how willing luminaries were to talk to a nobody. How accessible they were, how generous they were, how more than happy, let's talk, 
tell me what you're about. Let me tell you what's going on. And I found that to be broadly true. And I've continued to find that broadly true within the society that um, it, w- it was something that really stood out for me because it isn't that I, I hadn't belonged to professional associations before when, when my field of study was psychology. But I never had anything even vaguely approximating that degree of welcome and generosity from the American Psychological Association or the Association for Humanistic Psychology or, or whatever. So that, that had a profound impact on me. Um, it, had a sufficiently, it had a sufficiently profound impact that I think the following year the, the NSPI conference was in Chicago and I volunteered to do something that may have been the first year that I volunteered to do student volunteers. But I was I, I was so excited. I was so excited about what my experience was in Atlanta and so much wanting other people to have a similar kind of experience that I went out and I had artwork done and I had 500, 500 buttons made up with a with a sketch and the words be your own hugging booth (laughs) and and had the greatest fun giving them away and explaining you know explaining myself (laughs) um because it was it was that kind of a it was that kind of an open-hearted experience uh so true i i i tell people uh, about that, that I have not ever experienced that, and I would like to replicate that for others at the local chapter level. And it, you know, nowadays we can do that online, but um, that is the tradition of ISPI going back to NSPI was the willingness to share, the mentoring that others were willing to do uh, to you, regardless if they had just met you or uh, you were just new on the scene. It's and so there was very much of a very much of a pay it forward kind of a kind of a mentality or approach, and I, I took that into the uh, the local chapter work that I did. So I, you know, I, I I was an active member of the local chapter. I played different roles on the board. Um, I was chapter president of the Chicago chapter in 1992. Interestingly enough, 1992. Um, the Chicago chapter was the largest chapter of all the NSPI chapters in the world. We had over 700 members. Um, the Chicago chapter doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. It went out of existence last year. Um, I'm currently on the ISPI board, um, in part out of my love for what this uh, society is and out of my intention to try to uh, pay something forward and give something back, and uh, so you know, small steps. Um, a couple of other stories uh, through Lynn Carney. I met Carol Haig. Through Lynn and Carol, I met Roger Addison and Margot Murray Hicks and um, Walter Ratcliffe and. Um, uh, people who uh, were lovingly called the West Coast Mafia or the Bay, the, the Bay Area Mafia. Mm-hmm. And one of those people uh, was also Jim Hill. And uh, Jim, when I first met him, was still in the, I think he was still in the Army. Marine Corps. Marine Corps, thank you. Thank you. And he was he was getting out of the Marine Corps and he was looking for what he was going to do. And it looked like he was going to go, go back to school. And so when it came time for his retirement from the Marine Corps, um, some of us got together and this was, this was kind of uh, instituted in part by his wife, Iko and, and Carol Haig. To, to try to put together a surprise something or other for him. 
so I decided to fly out to California from Chicago and to stay, uh, I think to stay with, with Carol and then to go down to Camp Pendleton and, and to be there in the audience when he retired and surprise him when, when he retired that he would see three or four or five people from um, ISPI who were there to celebrate him and his success and whatever the next chapter is going to be. And you could not, I wish, I don't have a picture to show you, but his jaw was so low, he probably dislocated something. It, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful um, experience to, to, to be there and uh, to celebrate to celebrate him. Um, more recently, um, I think it was the ISBI conference four or five years ago that was held in, Re in Reno. And um, a number of folks from the Bay Area uh, took, took the train out. I took the train back with them. So I designed being at the conference. I was speaking at the conference. And uh, so there were about eight or nine of us on, on the train going, going back out to uh, to the Bay Area and and I can't give you the x-rated version but I'll, I'll just say that we had a heck of a good time yeah. you know we, we you know we, we packed a one picnic and and with wonderful food and wonderful wonderful wine and um, and and sat around and told stories and lies and 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 had a great time and then when we got back we had several days of doing things together. I think Margot invited us out to a winery uh, that sh that she's connected with. It was just all good. But again, it was like is like family. Um, I I consider some of my closest friends the people the people that I've met through ISPI. Um, I still plan business trips in in ways that get me back to connect with them. Um, it's just really, really sweet. You had said that you were, you also had a, a story about uh, Joe Harless that you might share with us. Um, Late Joe Harless. So uh, Joe's a, uh, for any of us who know him, like Joe is, Joe is a character, like a brilliant character, you know, just a down home, down home guy from Alabama and um, really took really took the uh, the systemic systematic approach to heart and to the nth degree so he was a, he was a protege of Tom Gilbert as I recall and so it was great fun the, the story is simply that it was great fun um, learning from Joe and going through his accomplishments his ABCD program, his accomplishment-based curriculum design program, and getting that rigor and having that documentation, and the documentation was like mm -hmm. disgustingly large, like more more things to gather dust. But I mean, like really, really good, grand experience. I'm really, really happy I did it. I may I may not have ever gotten a project out of it, but it really doesn't matter what what um, what mattered was that that this was this was part of the technology. So choosing to immerse myself in that was important. Was an important step for me, an important choice for me um, in my own professional development. Um, I think there was like a couple of other things we're sharing. Uh, I met. Mariana Bernardez at the ISBI Long Beach Conference, and Roger Kaufman introduced him to me. I kind of heard about him, but didn't know him. But we've come to be good friends as well as colleagues. And I was honored several years ago when 
uh, Mariana's Performance Improvement Institute was doing work in Mexico in the Sonora region and looking to and working with the uh, Sonora Institute of Technology it's a, um, to develop a doctoral program down there around HPT and uh, he asked me to co-teach uh, a doctoral level course with him on management and coaching and so it was great it was great to uh, to go down to see it at Obregon um, over the course of several months and teach that course it, it was a humbling experience in terms of uh, me learning um, about culture and um, all of the thing many many things that I was blind to that I discovered uh, in terms of cultural and co cultural differences and uh, And an opportunity, an opportunity to collaborate with a guy who is truly a, a systems and systemic thinker, a design, uh, a design, um, and to to learn and participate and, and try to try to contribute something. So that's been that's been an ongoing relationship that I've really appreciated, and it's 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 born fruit in terms of. Uh, uh, being invited to play in the City Doctors Forum in Barcelona and the work that's that may very well be there to do this year and beyond in Barcelona and perhaps Buenos Aires. Well, we shall see about that. Um, one of the things that I gave myself permission to do five years ago, that I knew about for a long time, but, but hadn't done anything about, was to give myself permission to attend the ISPI EMEA conference. So I'd heard about it. I knew Carol Panza, who was a person who was one of the initiators of it. Um, I had heard good things about it. I, I kind of would look wistfully in that direction, but do nothing about it. And I was at I was at the ISPI conference in Indianapolis, and I was standing in line to to, to go into a plenary session, and the people behind me were talking about their experience at the ISPI. EMEA conference the um, the previous fall in Tbilisi, Georgia, and what a what an extraordinary experience it was. And I I couldn't help but it was kind of like 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 listening. Mm -hmm. I try not try not to be too obvious about it, but I, I couldn't help but kind of interrupt and break in and ask questions. And um, I asked I asked them uh, if they knew where this year's conference was going to be. No, this is 2014. So this was in April of 2014. And they said, um, Warsaw. I said, cool. They said, uh, do you know if uh, the deadline for proposals is when that is? And they said, yeah, Sunday. <laughs> so I went, oh, <laughs> To myself, and immediately sought out Carol. And when I tracked her down, I made the following proposition: said I'm interested in proposing for the EMEA conference. I know that I won't be able to get a proposal drafted into you by this Sunday. If you would be willing. To give me an additional week, I'll get something to you for your committee's consideration. Would you be amenable to that? And she said yes. And so I immediately tracked down uh, Daniela Rogu, who I'd met at the previous year's ISPI conference in Reno. And I said, "This is here's here's the situation. Got." 10 days to put together a proposal for something. I would love I would love to do something with you. Would you be up for that? And she said yes. And we put together a proposal which was accepted. And what we ended up doing was we ended up building um, after after the conference in Warsaw, 
going to going to Bucharest, Romania, which is uh, she's from Romania. And so we had meetings with with uh, the dean of the business school, the dean of the economics uh, department at the university in Bucharest, and her family was there. So I got a chance to meet them and do some sightseeing, and then I went to Budapest. So that has led to me now for five years running, um, proposing, having proposals accepted, and speaking at EMEA conferences in Warsaw, in Istanbul, in Bonn, in Bologna, and in Gothenburg. And it provides me with a wonderful excuse to travel, to present and give back, to meet new folks, and to build in other stuff around the edges um, that that's fun stuff and learning stuff, learning edge for me. So um, I found an, an, an innumerable opportunities and innumerable ways for uh, for me to be enriched by the society and what it intends to accomplish and how how it tries to go about that and who the people are and and innumerable ways for me to uh, to try to contribute and give back as well. I certainly have been doing that. Um, let, let me kind of bring us to a close here. Um, first of all, thank you for, again for agreeing to do this uh, interview over Skype. And uh, um, I, my final question to you is, do you have any words of wisdom or guidance uh, for those in our audience who may be embarking on this journey into the land of human performance technology or evidence-based practices for performance improvement or whatever it might be called. What, what are your suggestions for those uh, who are interested in pursuing this? Be curious, be persistent, be willing to take a risk and reach out. Um, the field is incredibly rich and there is room for so many different expressions of it, every one of which can contribute and make a difference. So I guess that's to say that there's, you can, you can make or you can find your place and you can, um, you have a place to stand and fully express, and you have a place to be part of a larger whole as well that's there to make a difference. I, best game in town as far as I'm concerned, but I'm biased. <laughs> Me too. John, again, thanks again so much for uh, your willingness to sit down here and share with us, and uh, 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 and thank you for your past contributions to the society and to human performance technology and to those contributions that you have yet to make. But thank you so much for this. Really my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. You as well. Bye. Bye. -bye.